Hey, Reluctant Preppers, you could have been watching this video the moment it came out. By going to healingyourself.life and subscribing to our new sister channel, Healing Yourself. See you there. Healingyourself.life provides information for awareness, educational, and support purposes only and does not diagnose or prescribe treatment for any medical condition. Viewers are encouraged to do their own due diligence and consult with their own medical caregivers before making personal treatment decisions. Welcome back to HealingYourself.Life. I'm your host, Dunnigan Kaiser, and we're back with our off-grid doctor, Jane Nielsen, a family doctor and in practice in Northwest Ohio, and a former FDA researcher who's here today to talk with us about heart disease and heart health. Dr. Nielsen, thank you for joining us again on HealingYourself.Life. Happy to do it. We've, we've addressed many topics with you in the past, but we have not delved into heart health, which is a very uh, significant and growing concern in the U.S. and most Western countries, and uh, for women as well as men, which was traditionally the, the out, outpost of men uh, concern. So can you uh, lead us into what are the major topics you think we need to delve into on uh, heart disease and heart health? Well, my primary objective today is going to be to talk about mostly coronary artery disease and atherosclerosis. Um, but if you're expecting a lecture on statins, I'm not going to have anything good to say. Okay, um, I, I think we ought to, oh, I had a question I wanted to ask. I wanted to get some feedback for you and I about how people feel when I do this and show people articles. Is it useful or is it disrupting? Let's ask some people to give us some feedback. So okay? guys, in the comments underneath this video, please uh, add your response to how, what would be the most uh, useful form? Are you okay with the way that we've been doing it and sharing very fast, rapid order, uh, different references? Um, we have limitations on the ways that we can uh, show those, but if, if there's a specific ideas that you have, uh, we're open to those. We're open-minded, okay. right. Um, Tucker Carlson two nights ago had a lady on who had a long discussion, I'm going to make brief, and she asked a question, the U.S. government came out with the food pyramid and asked us to change all of our behavior to eliminate heart disease. How did it go? And she said it went terrible. Americans are exercising 30% more, they're smoking less, they're taking more antioxidants, they're doing everything they were asked, and they're eating the stupid upside down food pyramid. And we are fatter with more, more heart disease than we've ever had, okay? And I think it's important to realize that we're in a war against heart disease and we're losing, okay? Um, I wanna give people some, some things to think about today as we go through reference. If you would like everything I'm gonna talk about in one book, it's my old partner and his buddy wrote Reversing Heart Disease Now, Jim Roberts and Stephen Sinatra, okay? So this is a very good book that stem to stern covers all the risk factors of heart disease that I'm gonna talk about today. I can't go an entire session without beating up on stevia, okay? Since the last visit, I now have found out that um, a cardiologist that I work with has shown that people are getting falsely elevated BNPs and being diagnosed with congestive heart failure from using stevia. It's getting uglier. We've only been at this stuff now for what, about a year? And what I'm learning is just scary, okay? Let's do a little bit of a summary. I have a little chart here. I'm not gonna show it to you because I need it, okay? And this is the 14 daggers of arterial disease, which I'm gonna make 16 because they left two off. Uh, low fish oils, elevated C-reactive protein, high LDL, excess insulin, low HDL, high glucose, I think that's a, got a duplication in here, nitric acid deficiency, excess triglycerides, which is just another way of saying high carbohydrates, low free testosterone, excess fibrinogen, excess homocysteine, elevated high blood pressure, low vitamin K, excess cholesterol, and they left out chronic infection, and they left out elevated LPA. Not a bad test. This, if you type in 14 daggers of arterial disease, this chart will come up. Okay. Most doctors, when you go to them and say you're interested in your health, what do they do? Check your weight and your... Blood pressure and your cholesterol. Yeah. Okay. 
And when they check it, they do one thing. They tell you your total cholesterol, and maybe if you're lucky, they do an LDL and HDL, and yep. then they make a decision on the basis of it. We have now had a test in this country for the last 10 years called the Boston Heart Profile. If you seriously want to know your heart risks, ask your doctor to do the Boston Heart Profile. This is all colored when you don't print it off my black and white printer. And it goes through and looks at all of those small and large particle size issues and everything. Great stuff, okay? I think it's pretty irrelevant, but great stuff if you want to know that, okay? We used to look at it that way. This is the chart for the Fredrickson's hyperlipoproteinemia. This is near and dear to my heart, pardon the pun, because <laughs> I'm a type 2B. So is my dad, so is my brother, and so are both my boys. I have a sky-high cholesterol and the only thing that makes it come down is not eating carbs and taking the fillings out of my mouth. Okay, and we'll return to that story. We're all told, oh, we've got to get our HDL up. Right. I'm not even certain of that. There's some research that's going, eh, maybe we got sold a bill of goods on that one. Okay, so. That's supposedly good cholesterol. That's good cholesterol. Okay. Right, okay. So we went to our family doc and our LDL is higher than we want it to be and higher than he wants it to be. So what's the only thing they ever do? They write a statin. Okay. Well, let's just, how did that go? This is going to take a while. Just published this last year that statins cause diabetes. What's the number one risk of heart disease? Diabetes. Brilliant. So the drug you take in for your cholesterol increases another heart risk factor. That happens all the time when you work on cholesterol. If you take a statin, your LPA goes up. I, you know, uh, messing around with your cholesterol non-nutritionally is a bad idea. So how are we doing with our statin drugs? Here's Eli Lilly's drug that never made the market. Wonderful drug. Made your cholesterol go right down. Increased heart attacks. How about Vitorin? The only study that Vitorin didn't pay for and was done independently, increased heart attacks and strokes. They almost took it off the market. They should have taken it off the market. And there's a Toledo Blade article that uh, all the doctors were shocked by Vitorin. Shocked, but continued to get kickbacks, would be my answer, okay? Here was a real nice basic science article coming up and saying, how's the pharmacology on statins? <laughs> Wrong. Why? Because what do they do? We eat fried cholesterol and damage it so the body can't metabolize it. That's called trans fats. Trans fats are formed when you heat any nutritional fat above 300 degrees, which means fried, grilled, baked, or broiled. You can do a crock pot and you can boil, and those are the only ways you won't make a trans fat, right? And so we eat that cholesterol, but we also make cholesterol out of gamma linoleic acid and then go on to turn it into our hormones and make our cell membranes out of it. So when we take a lipid lowering agent, which one of these things do we get rid of? Does it dissolve the trans fats in our blood? No, it screws up our hormones and screws up our cell membranes and stops the cholesterol that our body wanted to manufacture to make things in our body. This is bad pharmacology. Does any doctor ever talk about the fact that the cholesterol-lowering drug is lowering your cholesterol, not the cholesterol that you ate? I've never heard a doctor talk about that. So how are they working? We use calcium scores on a C ultra fast CT, and they make calcium build up in the heart. So what side effects do we have? Well, at least now, we have at least one of the CoQ10 people is finally advertising that you ought to take CoQ10 if you're on a statin and people are learning it at least from the infomercials, right? Uh, but, you know, let's talk a little bit about rhabdomyolysis. Our understanding is, is that these drugs are making cholesterol fall in your blood. Well, it's not true. What they're actually doing is moving it into your muscle. See those little spots in there? Sure. The, oh, the reason you get rhabdomyolysis and pain is because you're taking all your cholesterol and packing it into your muscle fiber. So is this related? I have a good acquaintance who is actually a patient, uh, uh, one of the uh, cardiologists you mentioned, who can't take statins because he gets terrible muscle cramps. That's it. That's rhabdomyolysis. And that the insurance company for, said, you know, that's the only thing we're going to cover. That's the only thing we're going to cover. We're not going to cover this other 
thing that would lower your cholesterol because it's not approved unless you're taking a statin too. And after battling it for like two years or three years with saying, oh, now your labs have expired, now we lost your paperwork and on and on. Finally, he said, look, I went through open heart surgery. Are you sure you really want me to have that expense again? They said, well, actually, the amount of years it'll probably take you to go back to open heart surgery is longer than the average time between changing jobs for most people. So it'll probably be the next insurance company's problem, not our problem. <laughs> I like it. At least they were honest. Refreshingly honest. Refreshingly honest. And so, you know, CoQ10 works. Okay, I think that it ought to be federal law that you put CoQ10 in all cholesterol-lowering drugs. Mm. Okay, mm. the only problem is is CoQ10 is very hard to manufacture. Most of the stuff sold on the market is complete garbage. It has a melting point that's identical to body temperature, and it's crystalline. And if it melts and recrystallizes, it doesn't work anymore. So the one that I like is actually embedded in sugar so it can't re it can't melt and recrystallize what other people are doing is they're making it in the liquid form and putting it with oils that prevent recrystallization fascinating stuff but if you aren't taking the best coat if you aren't spending seventy dollars a month on your coq10 you're probably taking garbage okay mm -hmm. everybody says well that's okay I'll do red ye yeast rice bran I've told everybody for years that red yeast rice bran is just naturally occurring Lipitor. It also causes rhabdomyolysis. You really can't poison your cholesterol in to lower and expect to win, okay? So what else are we doing stupid that's causing heart disease? Calcium. Calcium causes heart disease, okay? Now you've cautioned you, us about calcium in oh, previous terrible stuff. But you said we should get it from dark vegetables. Vegetables is fine. Dairy's neutral, and pills will kill you. Bottom line, okay? Here's one that was interesting. They did a vitamin D study, and of course, they put calcium with the vitamin D, mm. and the vitamin D, which would have reduced heart disease 44%, instead took it up because of the calcium. That was a very confusing study. If you'd like more information on that, read the book Calcium Bomb, okay? Great great book written 10, 15 years ago, probably in its fifth edition, brilliantly done, goes through in great detail what I'm complaining about. The problem is, is what is associated as a mineral is low magnesium elevates your CRP. Well, when you take a thousand milligrams of calcium, you lose 400 milligrams of magnesium. The loss of magnesium causes your C-reactive protein to go up, which is your inflammatory trigger for atherosclerosis. So, the reason a calcium's killing you is because it's getting rid of your magnesium. So a lot of those uh, calcium magnesium supplements are come in combination, so that's not helpful either. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You should be taking pure magnesium and not magnesium oxide, one of the absorbable magnesiums. So then we see this research that low vitamin K is associated with atherosclerosis, and they've linked that to calcium. And so you know, you look at the DK calcium metabolism thing and you go, wow, that's really interesting. I said I'd come back to this one. There's another wonderful book. Dr. Hal Huggins, the man who made amalgam removal uh, a idea in American dentistry and made the American Dental Association finally get sued and stop. This is original book. It's all in your head. Okay. And he proved the link between mercury and cholesterol. When I, I'm, a, now I'm a Fredrickson's type 2B in medical school, my roommates all moved out and I had six dozen eggs. So I ate six dozen egg sandwiches for like two weeks <laughs> in the end of medical school and woke up one morning covered with these itchy pustules on my elbows and my scrotum that is classic xanthalisma. So I went in, got a cholesterol, and my total cholesterol was 2200 with an HDL of zero which got me an immediate cardiology consult and a lipoprotein electrophoresis and a diagnosis that I was type 2B Fredrickson's genetic disorder, okay? And they took years to go away. It was just a terrible experience. And as the years went on, my cholesterol fell down into about 1600. And then I went and practiced with a new, started nutritional medicine, and just so happened my teeth were falling apart because I was turning 40 and I wasn't in very good health because of my low testosterone. And I had seven crowns. Well, the seven crowns involved taking out seven very large amalgams. Hmm. And my cholesterol immediately dropped to 1100. 
in one step. By removing these large amalgam fillings, otherwise... I quit feeding mercury into my bloodstream. What's happening is the cholesterol in your bloodstream is holding the mercury so it doesn't go into your brain. This is the reason why some people, when they take statins, get brain symptoms because they're liberating mercury. Oh, how about that? Okay, which Huggins proved. Okay, so then I, I moved here and I had some more dental problems. And over a period of about two years, I did five more crowns and my cholesterol dropped to 300. The whole time my diet is the same. Okay, and my cholesterol has gone from 1600 to 300 because I took the fillings oh out of my goodness. head. Who's being told that? Nobody. Nobody's being told that. Okay, okay. What's the number one cause of heart disease in America? Let's re-ask that question. Who dies fastest from heart disease? Who has bypasses three years apart? Diabetics. Insulin-dependent diabetics. So let's go through that one. Study links insulin to coronary artery disease, but the study may be flawed. No, I think the study was just fine. Okay. Here's Metabolic syndrome, high blood sugar, pre-diabetic, associated with generalized atherosclerosis, hardening of all arteries. Okay. Here's a huge study on 75,000 people. And what they did is they divided them up into quintiles, bottom 20, next 20, middle 20, next 20, high 20. And they divided them according to how much carbohydrates they ate. And the risk went from one to two. You double your risk of heart disease when you go from the bottom amount of carbs in America to the top amount of nutritional carbs. They weren't asking people to do different things. They just divided America into five groups. And the group at the top had twice as much heart disease. That's an amazing number. Let's be fair. It also caused strokes. Metabolic syndrome caused strokes. Okay. Here you go. Here's um, Joe Mercola's article, Insulin, Not Cholesterol, is the True Cause of Heart Disease. And, you know, we've done the carb thing on every one of these talks. I'm not going to go back into carbs. And so go ahead. Let's not shoot insulin. Let's take the pills. Here's a study on Avandia, that Avandia increases your risk of heart disease. Let me tell you something. Every diabetes pill increases your risk of heart disease. The safest is diabetes pill is metformin, but then it poisons your B12, and B12 is what lowers homocysteine and elevated homocysteine causes heart disease. You can't pill your way to health. Get to ideal body weight, don't eat carbs, don't have disease. I don't see any heart disease in my practice because I forbid people to be diabetic in my practice. People come into me with diabetes, and I put them on low carbs and they don't do it. I give them one visit. I go, if you don't come back having lowered your glycohemoglobin at your next visit, I don't want you as a patient. Goodbye. And as a result, I see no heart disease and I have no diabetes in my practice. It's all about motivating people. There are many, many risk factors for heart disease. This one's genetic, APO, A, and B. A is good, B for bad, okay? It's a ratio. If your B gets higher than your A, Oh boy, you get heart disease fast. Is your doctor checking that? That's a genetic factor. You're it's saying? genetic. You can't change it. Okay. Mm. There's a few of those out there. Okay. I talked about homocysteine. Homocysteine is a sulfa metabolic byproduct from the liver that is lowered by folic acid and B12. And it, when it's up, it is like an accelerant to coronary artery disease. Okay. And uh, in this case, you always want to make the point, this isn't just about your heart. Here's a study showing that homocysteine, which we think of as heart disease, mm. is causing Parkinson's to be worse. So it's neuroinflammatory. Here's another one that you're born with and you can't fix very well. Fibrinogen, the clotting factor. Yeah. Makes sense, right? Okay. If you've got gout, it increases the risk of your heart disease. Fascinating stuff. And that's uh, often diet related as well? Go. No, it's genetic. Uh, people talk about trying to change it with diet, but the only thing in your diet that changes your uric acid is beer. Not hard liquor, not wine. Beer really causes uric acid to go up. Okay, so let's switch over and go, okay, I got coronary artery disease and I'm fat and diabetic and doing everything wrong and popping my pills and everything's going to pieces. What's my other risk factor? High blood pressure. Okay. And so, 
I'm really good at blood pressure. And I'm really good at blood pressure because I figured something out 40 years ago that medicine figured out 20 years ago and then didn't tell anybody. <laughs> and that is 40% of all high blood pressure isn't high blood pressure. It's white coat. What does that mean? It means my blood pressure's up because I'm in a doctor's office. Oh. White coat hypertension. Okay. I have the greatest story. I got to tell this story. 1981, I've taken over the premier retiring family doctor in my community's practice. Everybody loved Hank Lair. Okay. Hank was a great doctor. And now me and my wife are taking over this guy's practice. Okay. And I walk in one day and I meet this little old lady. She might have been 60, but I was 31 then. So she was an old lady to me. Now she'd be a young woman. And my nurse has circled in the chart 254 over 134 blood pressure in red with two circles. And I looked at it and I went up and took her pulse. Couldn't find it. Listened to her heart. Could barely hear it. Looked in her eyes. No changes of our atherosclerosis. She should have been grade three. She had grade zero um, our, you know, arterial changes in her eyes. And I asked her how she felt, and she said, tired and dizzy. Dr. Nielsen, if you could make tired and dizzy go away, I'd be thrilled. Well, she was there with her daughter, and her daughter was the head nurse on my med surg unit at my hospital, and a good friend. And I said, Sandy, do you do home blood pressures? And she said, no. And I said, do them. Call me. Four hours later, I get an emergency call. Come to the phone. Sandy's on the phone. Mom's dying. So I go, oh, what did I do? Well, I didn't do anything, okay? She's dying from high blood pressure, right? Okay? And so I get Sam, I go, what's going on? She says, mom's dying. And I said, what's she look like? She says, well, she's eating lunch. <laughs> this is a true story, okay? And I said, then she's not dying, Sandy. And she said, her blood pressure is 60 over 30. And I said, just as I thought. And I stopped all five of her blood pressure medicines. Uh -huh. She came back in four weeks later. Sandy and I talked every couple of days as we tapered and the beta blockers had to be stopped slowly. And, and she came back in the next visit. And she said, Dr. Nielsen, oh, thank you. Everything's gone. I'm on no meds and I feel wonderful. And my nurse has circled 300 plus, because the manometer will only go to 300 and it stopped, oh over 156. And I put a stethoscope on her, heart's hammering away, pulse is full. And I said, Sandy, what was her blood pressure this morning at breakfast? She said, 120 over 72. Nice. That's white coat hypertension. <laughs> Can you imagine how nervous you get if every oh time you goodness. come in, your doctor makes you feel worse by giving you more blood pressure meds? Right. Everyone who has hypertension needs to have their own blood pressure cuff. Do 100 blood pressures, middle of the day, after working at home. I tell people, you do them like diving scores. You do 10 in a group, and you mark out the highest and the lowest, and you average the eight, and you keep doing that. And if you do that over two weeks, your blood pressure will fall 15 over 10 points. Okay. That's just getting used to having your blood pressure taken. Sure. That's your blood pressure. Now, the second problem that when so here, here they come, this is all in the literature, self-monitoring improves blood pressure control, okay? Got to get to it here. This is the new guidelines. The new guidelines are they now want you at 100 over 60 or some stupid number like that, okay? It's 140 over 90. That number hasn't changed. This research has been done for 150 years since Figmo developed the manometer or whatever his name was, okay? This is insane. We got people walking around with fatigue and dizziness and dementia, and it's all because they're hypotensive. I can't get over Sphigmo. <laughs> Dr. Sphigmo? I, mean, I, don't, I don't know if Dr. Sphigmo developed the Sphigmo manometer. I made that one up, okay? Okay, here's one. Here's a guy who opined that new hypertension meds are not better than the old ones. Boy, do I agree. I developed most of the old ones. This was what my big job. I put like 13 blood pressure meds on the U.S. market when I was a researcher in the 80s. Those drugs are the drugs I use today. The new drugs have more side effects with less benefit. And the only reason doctors are writing them is because they got a pharmaceutical rep in their office, two free pizzas, and a kickback. That's how medicine works. The old blood pressure medicines were more researched 
and are better designed. You really couldn't improve them. Everybody gets a beta blocker at their first visit. A lot of people have done a lot of research, said these drugs really have a lot of side effects. Put them down at about number four. You should be using ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, okay? I'm done with blood pressure, okay? Get a cuff, okay? Talk to Dr. Spigno, okay? Pain meds cause heart disease. I looked at that and I went, I can't figure that out. And then I went, oh, pain meds lower testosterone. Now you mentioned NSAIDs in particular. Even I'm getting there. It's okay. on here. All right. Okay. All right. Low thyroid. Real tough on the heart. Lots of heart failure. Okay. Um, so here we go. We have known that non anti-inflammatory drugs greatly increase your risk of coronary artery disease for 20 years. Okay, it was the Vioxx controversy. They left Celebrax, they took Vioxx off the market, yeah. they left Mobic, and they looked at everything. So, did we turn around and look at every NSAID to see if they were safe? Mm-hmm, we certainly did. Okay, what's the most dangerous NSAID? Which NSAID causes the most heart disease? Ibuprofen, Motrin. Why aren't they telling us? Because it's over the counter. They blew it. They picked the wrong drug. Naperson's not far behind it, okay? Here's a huge meta-analysis that gave us all of the numbers. If you go in Google Scholar and put in Bayesian meta-analysis and the word NSAID, this study will come up, and you can look your anti-inflammatory up and find out how fast it's killing you. Can we you. take one minute to explain what you meant when you said go to Google Scholar? Because most people have no idea. Well, if you is. go up in Google and type in Google Scholar, you come up to a search engine that has no ads, no blogs, no private people, no complaints, no nothing. It's just the research in medicine. It's available to all of the public. It's where I do all of my clinical researches in Google Scholar. Okay? Everybody should try it. It's a lot of fun. Okay, just incredible stuff. There it is, Celebrex. They left it on the market. It doubles heart disease, and we left it on the market. Vioxx got taken off the market. Yeah. It wasn't that bad compared to Celebrex. Why'd Celebrex stay? Well, the answer is they put it before a panel, and the Celebrex people loaded the panel with their staff. That's how the FDA works. Okay, if you're on a nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory at the time you have a heart attack you're more likely you'll die from that heart attack. If you take one Motrin tablet, the likelihood that you'll have a heart attack in the next seven days is 70% higher. Or Advil. Now all of them, all the non-steroidals. Few drinks, atrial fibrillation. Lots of things cause atrial fibrillation. We'll be back to that, okay? So, okay. So we've caused a disease, and we've now looked at the mechanisms, and we've looked at her traditional therapies, and we've looked at the things that kill you. So let's go ahead, crack our chest in half, and do a four-vessel bypass, or let's put a catheter in, and let's put in a stent. How are we doing? Okay. First of all, everybody comes out of cabbage, four-vessel bypass, thinking they had a stroke. No, they didn't. It was the anesthesia. People come in all the time, but the, what they do do is they come in and say, I had a stroke, I numbed down my arm. And I go, no, you aren't. Have you ever seen them intubate you? They actually have you on your back, lift you with your tongue until they can see down your throat. If you took me over there right now at the tongue blade, could you see down my throat? You wouldn't even be within 45 degrees. They're kinking your neck so back so bad, they're herniating your discs. And everybody's coming out of surgery going, I think I had a stroke. Nah, it's anesthesia. Nah, they broke your neck. You know, I, all the surgeons hate me because I send a note in and say, don't intubate the patient. Go get a fiber optic scope and do it that way. And they hate it because it takes more time. If you get your hips replaced, your likelihood you'll have a heart attack in the next three months goes up 400%. That's just inflammation and anesthesia. So, okay, let's not do a bypass. Let's do percutaneous angioplasty and put a stent in. How are we doing? Really, if you aren't having unstable angina, if you can take a pill and it goes away and you're okay for a few days and then you take a nitro, you wasted your time and put yourself at risk, okay? Put stents in, 
and your memory goes worse. I didn't get an explanation for why that was true. Many angiographies dreamed unnecessary. Both my boys are interventionalist cardiologists, identical twins. They're very good doctors trained at the University of Michigan, and they do a lot less stents and a lot less caths than the numbskulls in some local little hospital because they know the guidelines. The more you go to a big center, the better care you'll get. Okay, here we go. Your nexium is tripling the likelihood you'll develop atrial fibrillation, PPIs, proton pump inhibitors, omperazole, ass effects, all of those drugs. Oh, here's one. I'm doing this all the time. We used to send people to the hospital for a 24-hour halter monitor and hope they had their palpitation during the 24 hours. Yeah, I've been through that. For $99, you can now buy this little device, download this app on your smartphone, and do your own halter monitor anytime you have an arrhythmia, and it automatically sends it to me by email. I think my copay was like three times that. Exactly. Monitor, yeah. This the Cleveland Clinic loves this thing. They're telling everybody we're all done with event monitors. Get a Cardia, Cardia Mobile with a K. Okay. If you're having arrhythmia, it's just a wonderful tool. Love it. Okay. So now we got to treat some heart disease here. Okay. You got it. You came to me too late. You're 60. You got four vessel heart disease, and You've decided you don't want to do your statins and get your blood pressure checked at your family doctor's office, right? Okay, so let's real quick, we're going to run through some therapy. This has a long history, EDTA chelation, okay? Go down to your local quack. I'm board certified in chelation therapy, okay? <laughs> Go down to your local quack and he'll stick an IV in you once a week for 30 weeks and then once a month the rest of your life and do an IV and calculate how much EDTA you can take and reverse your heart disease, right. okay? Does it work? Yes. If you want to know a lot about EDTA, type in history of EDTA, and you can get it right there from www.schachtercenter.com, or you can put history of EDTA, Michael Schachter, S-C-H-A-C-H-T-E-R. This is like 100 pages long, written by a friend of mine, John Trowbridge, Brilliant stuff. Okay, guess what? The patent went off of EDTA after 50 years, and now you can do it three times as fast for a tenth of cost with a rectal suppository. Mm. Now, I don't like detoxamine. I just happen to have a picture of this. I like Kelotox. But remember, if you take EDTA and you have your fillings in your head, it pulls the mercury out of your fillings, puts it in your brain. So they better get the fillings Got to get first. the fillings out. Got to get a hair analysis. Make sure you got rid of the mercury before you start doing that. We all heard the term the Paleolithic diet. The man who made that famous is Robert Cranion. Robert Cranion is the head of the Vitamin D Council who made us realize vitamin D is important. That's not what he's famous for. He's famous for carnitine. Okay. Wonderful supplement. Taking L-carnitine completely rebuilds your heart. You'll learn that in Sinatra and Robert's book, okay? Okay, number two. Never will stop being true. Baby aspirin a day reduces your risk of heart disease between 16 and 30% depending on the study. Over and over. Now, aspirin is an NSAID, is it not? It is, but it's uh, their NSAIDs and it's aspirin. It's a completely different pathway. They're not platelet anticoagulants, okay. stopping platelet adhesiveness, and they're poisoning COX-1 over COX-2, or COX-2 over COX-1 and unbalancing COX, which is why Vioxx was worse than, than Motrin in some cases. In the end, I don't think I believed any of that. They lied to me about everything. So I, aspirin is protective. All the other ones are terrible, okay? Aspirin is equal to warfarin, Coumadin, the blood thinner mm -hmm. for preventing uh, heart disease. Not strokes, heart disease. Aspirin in older people spares gray matter in the brain. Mm. Alzheimer's, okay? Aspirin cuts your risk of your first stroke, 17%. Aspirin cuts all mortality, 25% in women. Now, some of that percent is coming from the prevention of colorectal cancer. Okay? You go, I'm allergic to aspirin. Why don't you do what the Europeans do? 
High-dose digestive enzymes on an empty stomach. This book is wonderful. The Aspirin Alternative Using Systemic Enzymes. We've talked about fermented foods. Yeah. This is fermented foods. You don't want to spend money on supplements. Start getting out the fermented foods. Okay. Okay. Shift gears again. Vitamin E. Been taking 800 IUs of vitamin E since the day I found out my cholesterol was 2200. Do we have proof? You go to your cardiologist and they go, oh, it doesn't work. They did a study for two years on 900 women and concluded it didn't help 30 to 40 year old women who didn't develop any heart disease so they couldn't get rid of any. That was what the study really showed. Front page, Associated Press, vitamin E proven not to work. This study went on for 20 years. The Harvard nurse study, one of the biggest studies ever done on heart risk, 13,000 women, and it dropped your risk from 1 to 0.59, a 41% reduction in women. Don't worry, guys. You came back 0.47. Even better, 2% better, because men get heart disease sooner, okay? Been here before, last lecture. Low testosterone causes heart disease. Last time we talked about it because of T. This time we talk about it because of heart disease, okay? Fixing your testosterone lowers the risk of heart disease in all categories, atrial fib, congestive heart failure, coronary artery disease. They trashed it and said, no, no, it causes heart disease. And then they undid that. What happened? Well, what happened is we gave men testosterone they got off the sofa, went to the gym, got on a treadmill, didn't bother to see their cardiologist first for a treadmill, and dropped over from a heart attack. They had a heart attack. They already had the heart disease. They just didn't have the energy to have a heart attack. <laughs> Here's one. Taking the antibiotic doxycycline lowers heart disease. The bacteria in your teeth and bad teeth is associated with heart risk. Right. We've talked about that right. before. We're getting bacteria out of the body and getting pyrogens out of the body, okay? Vitamin C and E reduce heart risk. Folic acid lowers blood pressure. Now, that might be through homocysteine. This is one of my favorites. I'm the last doctor on earth to use Digitalis. I wrote it Monday, okay? And here's a guy who says, we need to go back to that drug. It's a really good drug for atrial fibrillation, et cetera. You don't want to take statins? Take fish oils, okay? 40% of all people who take fish oils get GERD, heartburn. If you get any gastric symptoms from fish oils, yeah. then go over to green muscle extract, which is Omega XL, or go over to krill oil and kill a whale. And Those are your choices. Green lipped muscle is, I think, what I've seen. Average. Omega XL. Okay. I'm on it. Okay. okay? Good news, dark chocolate really does work. <laughs> okay. Again, use Coumadin. This is Dirk Pearson and Sandy whatever her name, Life Extensions, the book, written in the 70s, and they were basic scientists. They weren't didn't have an agenda, drug versus herbal, and they studied everything that would make you live longer, and they said that humans have are over coagulable compared to all other mammals and that if you take enough Coumadin to make your clotting time the same as all other mammals, you would live longer. And that's called small vessel disease. It's one of the contributing factors to dementia. I diagnose it every month in my practice. It really helps. Last one, you had a heart attack the, or a stroke the day you can crawl out of the hospital, already have made an arrangement to go to your local private cash hyperbaric chamber and do a hyperbaric treatment, and you will reverse how much myocardium you lose from your heart attack. Wow. This stuff blows my mind. I can't believe how wrong we are. I just cannot believe how screwed up cardiology is. A lot of what you were describing, again, seems to be the expensive, high-risk drugs versus the 
Simple stuff. Simple stuff. All right, fix your B12, take some folic acid, quit eating carbs, take a baby aspirin. That's all I've done. Huh? Two vitamin E, a baby aspirin. I've had a cholesterol of 2200 for 15 years of my life. I just did a treadmill two years ago and went 16 minutes. My son wow. said, wow, I'm wow. really impressed. Nothing. You're great. You're clean as a whistle. Come on, I had a cholesterol of 2200 for half of my life. 1100 for the other half. It's only been in the last eight years I got it down to 300 And I got nothing. Because I took a baby aspirin, two vitamin E, and, e, and as soon as I learned about D, I started fixing it. Yep. And I don't eat carbs. And you got your lead out of your mouth. And, and I got my, got my mercury out yeah, of my mouth. Right. Right. You know, why don't, why don't people know this? This stuff, it just, it just well, blows my mind. Well, because it doesn't make obscene profits for the drug companies, yeah. for one thing. Well, you look at my practice. My, you know, about twice a year, one of my patients gets admitted to the hospital. How's the American Hospital Association feel about this video? Oh, they just hate it. They make all of their money off of disaster, off of failed therapy. You know? You didn't mention uh, taurine, which is also an inexpensive supplement that can help the magnesium. You did mention right. magnesium. Yeah, Ma taurine makes magnesium go into the cell. Okay. Right. All right. Yeah. Well, this, this has is been pretty a, straightforward stuff. This has been a high-speed whirlwind tour through a lot of uh, uh, challenging stuff for a lot of people are going to have to say, what about this? Where do, I, where do I get these supplements? How do I get the good ones or whatever? You gave some guidelines on CoQ10 that there's certain ones that are better than others. Um, for the other ones, the D, the uh, uh, green-lipped mussel or krill rather than fish oils, if people have any trouble taking fish oils. That's the Omega XL. Okay. They're a little multi-level marketing. They keep doing this thing where they send you two and charge you for two when you ordered one and tell you it's free and then it isn't. And I go, just get mad at them and they treat you right. I, I, at first they kind of PO'd me, but now they're okay. Well, uh, viewers, we know you're going to have a lot of questions and comments, so please feel free to uh, provide feedback in the comments section under this video. And once again, we thank Dr. J. Nielsen, MD, for giving us what you're not likely to hear from your local doctor or from the medical literature or on the mainstream media about how to take care of yourself in face of one of the biggest threats uh, in, our, in our culture to health, but has some very low cost and common sense alternatives. Yep. So once again, thank you for joining us on healyourself.life. Great to be here.